good uh, afternoon, good morning for people in the other side of the world, good afternoon for people here in Europe or in other continents. Okay, uh, we are ready to start our European Distance uh, Learning Week. This is, I think, the fourth uh, webinar of this uh, week, and this is uh, a very interesting topic and a very actual topic, which is artificial intelligence in higher education. Uh, let me introduce also Diana Andone, which is a Vice President of Communication of Eden. Uh, Diana and myself will be the moderators. And we have uh, today four uh, presenters, uh, well-known presenters, uh, about this topic, artificial intelligence in higher education. Professor Tony Bates, uh, Professor Olaf Sawaki Richter from University of Oldenburg, Andrea Alexandra Christia from Durham University and Cristobal Cobo from Oxford Internet Institute. Just a few words uh, to start uh, remembering that this is uh, an event organized by, by Eden. I'm sure all of you know uh, very well which is Eden, European Distance and E-Learning Network, uh, which aim is, of course, share knowledge and improve understanding amongst professionals about the topics of the network. And uh, this network uh, is organized uh, with different kind of uh, participations. Uh, we have uh, close to 200 institutional members and also more than 200 individuals and 1,000 people in our NAP network, academics and professionals. At the end, we will uh, share with you uh, some uh, future events of our network. And let me also remind that EDEN is supported by, by the European Commission. And now I give uh, the floor to Dejan Andone in order to introduce a little bit this webinar and also to start with our first speaker. Diana. Please put your mic on. Yeah, I cannot hear you. Please, Diana, your microphone. Okay, I think Diana is having uh, some problems with uh, her microphone. Okay, I think it's better if we can continue so in order to... Um, let me introduce the, the first speaker uh, today. I think it's well done for all of us. It's Professor Tony Bates, uh, which is president of Tony Bates Associates. It's a private company in consulting and training. <clears throat> um, and he is also a distinguished visiting professor uh, and, and well known for all of us. Uh, Tony, uh, please, uh, if, um, Dora, if you can put you, uh, Tony's presentation here on the screen, and, and Tony, the floor is yours. Well, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. It's a great pleasure for me to be presenting to you on this topic. Uh, I don't have a great deal of expertise in artificial intelligence, um, I, um, and I'll, I actually want to discuss the issue for many educators uh, around this issue of knowing what's going on in artificial intelligence. But I have been following developments in the literature um, fairly closely, um, both in learning analytics and in artificial intelligence. And there are a number of key issues that come out of, out of this work that I, that I want to, to raise today. Uh, first of all, I think there are some definitional problems that I just want to mention very briefly. And I want to make a distinction between 
uh, three areas. One is statistical analysis that's been around for a very long time. This would include things like uh, multiple variant analysis, multiple regression analysis, analysis of variance. And this is commonly used in doing research in, in education, and it's well established. And then there's learning analytics, which is basically trawling data, uh, trawling educational data in a search for patterns, um, which, and it doesn't actually make decisions itself. It may suggest decisions, but in the end, somebody has to look at that pattern and make the decisions, and it's usually educators or administrators that make those decisions. And then there's what I would call full-blown artificial intelligence, which uses algorithms to identify and interpret patterns of student behavior. In other words, it actually can make decisions and does make decisions. Um, although, again, it may be used in partnership with, with an educator. In other words, it may recommend a decision, but an educator may overrule that decision. But um, in other words, artificial intelligence goes further than the other two. Um, uh, and sometimes I see papers that have the title artificial intelligence that are really learning analytics or just statistical or advanced statistical analysis. And so I, I've drawn this little diagram to show the overlap because you can have statistical analysis within artificial intelligence and you can have learning analytics at, uh, with, can, can, can be driven by artificial intelligence or it can stand alone. But the key thing of the, in artificial intelligence to me seems to be the algorithms uh, which look for patterns and may actually come up with some decisions as well. Um, so I, I just wanted to put that out there so that you, you, when we hear these terms, uh, we don't get them confused. And I'll, what I actually wanted to talk about is artificial intelligence here. And there are three core features of, my, of any application of artificial intelligence. Uh, access to massive amounts of data. The, the more data, the better. The more powerful the tools are, the more data there are. Powerful algor algorithms for helping uh, to, to find, search, and identify uh, data, um, analyzing that data and then recognizing patterns within that data. And also, there may be some algorithms in there for decision making as well. And for that to work, you need very powerful computing. And usually, that means going into the cloud um, to use very powerful computing, unless you've got a very big computer like Watson, for instance. So those are the core features. What are the applications of artificial intelligence in higher education? Well, it, th there's three levels of application. One is at an institutional level. Um, for instance, uh, to help institutions make decisions about which students to admit, um, uh, where, to, where to market uh, students, where, uh, how to go out and use data out there for marketing, uh, making decisions about marketing, and also, to some extent, curricular decisions. I think we'll see more and more where uh, artificial intelligence is used to go out and trawl data that's already out there, like open educational resources, and uh, analyze what kind of uh, content goes well together and how to put that content together into a curriculum. Uh, and that might well be linked, say, to uh, what employers are demanding in the way of skills, for instance. And I'll come back to that towards the end, because I think this is one critical area for artificial intelligence that has not been very much explored at the moment. The second area is student support. Uh, intelligent tutoring, such as chatbots, these are uh, software that uh, uh, runs around. Let's, let's, say, let's say that you've got a, a massive online course, a MOOC, and there's lots of comments going on. The chatbots will go through all the comments that students are making, and where they see students maybe misinterpreting information or needing help, the chatbot will, will give automated responses. And again, this may be used in conjunction with real life people. In other words, the chatbots might identify areas where students are having difficulty and flag that for an instructor to intervene. Um, it's also used for providing automated feedback. Um, so that students, 
uh, can can know whether they've learned something correctly or not. Um, and also prediction, in other words, providing students with early warnings that they're struggling or they may have to do more work and, and, and so on. But again, it's not actually teaching them, it's just providing support to their learning. And the third one is actual teaching, instructional, where uh, such things as adaptive learning, where students are tested and if they get it wrong, they're redirected to another to do more work, and assessment such as automated grading. Um, and again, what we're seeing in the literature is there's quite a bit of literature on institutional applications and student support, um, and less on what I would call advanced artificial intelligence in the instructional area. Um, it's still mainly old artificial intelligence, such as adaptive learning and assessment, which has been around for some time. What's been the main impact to date on higher education? Well, I have to say, from my search of the literature, and there's a big issue here, and I'll come back to that in a minute, but um, I, I see very little major impact to date on higher education. As I said, it's mainly at the institutional level, screening. It's mainly old artificial intelligence that doesn't have powerful tools such as deep learning algorithms and so on being applied. Um, some attempt at essay marking, which is using uh, linguistic analysis and so on, but again, that's not proved to be very successful for uh, higher level learnings. Some learning analytics, um, and where there has been learning analytics, there's often no significant difference. In other words, the learning analytics haven't really helped to identify um, strategies that instructors should be following, for instance. There have been some experiments with MOOCs uh, you applying because there's massive amounts of data. Again, it, the, the, the results are not impressive. And most importantly, where it has been used, it's been applied to what I would call low levels of learning, although they're quite important levels, such as comprehension and understanding. What the um, National Research Council of the United States calls de declarative knowledge. It's uh, name of plants, testing people on the name of plants. Uh, it does do a little bit of process. Uh, you can do uh, process teaching, teaching processes like problem solving in mathematics, but it tends to be at what Bloom would call the lower levels of learning objectives. Um, it's, it's not proved successful to date at tackling the more difficult things such as concept developments, uh, cognitive uh, cognitive learning, high-level problem solving, and so on. So it's been disappointing to date. Why? Well, most of the papers written on artificial intelligence are written by computer scientists um, who have a, tend to have a very limited understanding of learning. They have a particularly behaviorist approach um, to teaching and learning. Um, although they don't, I'm not sure they understand it's a behaviorist approach, but it's just the approach they take. Uh, you t test, uh, redirect, test again, redirect, uh, test again and redirect, and so on. Um, and it's data-driven rather than theory-driven. In other words, it's hoped that the patterns will provide some kind of meaning, um, but often they don't. If anybody's actually done as, uh, multiple regression analysis in statistics, you know, You've got a lot of variables, and you've got some weights to the different variables, but knowing how they interact is really hard to interpret. And the, probably the most worrying thing for me is often the applications of artificial intelligence are contrary to what I think are some of the core values of education, such as equitable access and the agency of the individual. Um, I don't want to go into detail there, because I'm sure others will be talking about that. but. Um, it, it seems to me an attempt to um, make life easier for administrators, but not necessarily further the interests of students. And I think another reason is that in education, and I'll come back to that in a minute, the data sets are too small. Um, if you look at the higher education system, it's very fragmented. Yes, you might have a big university of 20,000 students, but what you really want to look is the whole, at least the 20 million students that might be in the system, not just the 20,000 in the university to get some really good results. But my last message is don't be complacent. 
Um, I, I think that artificial intelligence could have a major impact on higher education um, because once, once some of the more advanced levels of artificial intelligence are intelligently applied to teaching and learning. And this change is going to be driven by the global internet platforms. Um, the higher education market globally is very, very large. Uh, there's a lot of money to be made in this area. And let's be clear what the artificial intelligence goal is here is not to improve the higher education system as it exists at the moment. Uh, it's to meet employer expectations and, if possible, bypass the institutions by reducing costs. And I've done a little diagram here about one potential model that might be used. Each of those arrows uh, reflect areas where artificial intelligence is used. So, for instance, um, give you an indication, LinkedIn, um, it's now possible to go into LinkedIn and identify all the skills that employers are requiring over the next 15 to 20 years. Um, an internet platform could go in and trawl that data and produce a skills inventory. That's number two. Commercial educational providers can go into that skills inventory and using artificial intelligence could develop um, automated programs that learners can then uh, enroll in. And also, um, employers and internet platforms could create a qualifications warranty or skills bank using, for instance, blockchain. So one could have a system that completely bypasses institutions. And I think that's, that's the danger. So my questions are, is that artificial intelligence an opportunity or threat? Is it all smoke and mirrors? Will it disrupt the higher education system? And what are the implications for learners, teachers, and institutions? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tony. I think maybe we can uh, change uh, the, the order of our presenters. Um, maybe because our lab is having uh, uh, some troubles uh, with the communication. Maybe, uh, Diana, if you want to introduce uh, Alexandra. Diana? Diana, can you hear me? Okay, yeah. Okay. Um, I, I can just introduce myself, it's fine. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Uh, we are losing our time in these things, but... Uh, Okay, uh, Professor Alexandra Cristea, if you want to start uh, your uh, presentation, remember that you have uh, 15 minutes. Uh, Professor Cristea is a mem member of the Durham University, and as you can see here on the slide, here you have a short presentation. Okay, Alexander, the, the, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, can you just... Ah, yes, those are my slides. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so thank you very much for uh, for inviting me to this panel and, and uh, hopefully you can hear me, yes? yes. Uh, so my name is Alexandra Krista and uh, I uh, work in Durham University uh, and uh, I've been working in AI in the area of AI for, uh, for quite some time now before it was uh, so very popular. Uh, I've also been learning, uh, working on distance learning for quite a while and AI applied to education. Uh, and I think we're living in quite exciting times in terms of AI. Uh, so I, I'm less scared, perhaps, to some extent than, than uh, uh, Tony in this area, because I think it's, it's a great opportunity for us um, that AI is moving so fast. And hopefully, uh, unlike in other areas, uh, I mean, unlike in other advances of science, we can catch up in higher education uh, and in education in general and e-learning in general with uh, with these trends and with these developments and, and make good use of them. Um, I do uh, share his concerns in, in terms of uh, actual um, 
deeper understanding and, and deeper uh, concern uh, regarding uh, the educational process, but um, uh, I think there is a great uh, opportunity as well. So yes, uh, I'm, um, I'm also chairing the Innovative Computing Group, so these are some slides from there. Uh, and uh, we're also hiring people in AI uh, and bias in AI and all sorts of other wonderful areas around this. Um, I'm, and we have uh, 15 staff members there. I'm going to talk a little bit about learning analytics because this is something uh, that I'm doing a lot of. Uh, and um, first of all, there's several definitions of learning analytics. And my favorite one is, is one by a very good friend that unfortunately passed away. Uh, maybe many of you know him, Eric Duval, a very famous professor from uh, Leuven. Uh, he was saying that learning analytics is about collecting traces that learners leave behind and using those traces to improve learning. So I highlighted on this slide the two bits that I think are very important. One is the collecting traces part. So it doesn't actually say specifically what to collect as long as it's something left behind by, uh, by the learners. And importantly, and I think slightly uh, conflictually to what Tony was saying to some extent, uh, it's about improving learning. So learning analytics is, shouldn't be enough if, if it doesn't at least attempt to use this data to some extent towards improving learning. Um, now, having said that, uh, it's not all, let me just try and go to the next slide, yeah. It's not all that uh, that simple because basically there's, there's a lot of aspects to learning analytics and this is what uh, you see here on my slide. You have descriptive analytics and that would be kind of the type of view that I think uh, Tony was presenting on, on learning analytics, where, where you just collect all the data and, and show it and model it perhaps to some extent, perhaps visualize it, that also is a part of it, so it could help in the decision process. But you also have other things. You have diagnostics, uh, where we're trying to respond to things like, why did it happen? And that's actually quite old AI questions. Um, it's not something new, why and how, uh, explaining um, why something happened, and, and uh, usually this is a hard question to answer for neural networks, again, traditionally, because they're black boxes and we only know the inputs and the outputs. Uh, and then we have things like predictive analytics, where, where you're trying to um, figure out uh, what's happened and, and make some predictions, uh, and here are some papers of, of mine on that. And, and then finally, prescriptive analytics, which is supposed to be the sort of more interesting part, where you actually start telling people what to do as a result of the analytical uh, data. Uh, so, uh, you know, you already have done the prediction and, and then as a next step, uh, you're telling them uh, what to do. Now, funnily enough, prescriptive is actually a bit easier to some extent than diagnostic because sometimes the, the diagnosis is, is harder. Uh, and I could talk about that more, but let's move on to, to the stakeholders of learning analytics. So I think uh, Tony has, has discussed some so basically, we have the whole, the whole lot, the whole pyramid, as you can see it here. So all the way from uh, higher level government, uh, um, then institutions, teachers, uh, students, uh, but you have also groups, classrooms, uh, learning groups, um, academics, um, and, and all of these could be actually uh, our stakeholders in learning analytics and could be consumers of the output uh, or, or producing the data. Uh, so they could be both on the input and on the output side. Um, it's not always happening like that, and of course people look at different aspects of this. So having said that, you know, you have all this spectrum, that doesn't mean that everybody always uses the whole spectrum, either in stakeholders or in learning analytics types. But I think this is basically what it all entails altogether. Uh, and of course not to forget the, the researchers as well in, in this area, which are interesting to, interesting to find out new ways to uh, to generate this kind of metrics and uh, measurement, etc. Uh, so I call them micro, meso, and macro levels. Um, so in terms of methodologies, again, uh, so yes, I do agree with the fact that you know we have at the bottom somewhere statistics, but that's not all. So you, we have also things like uh, data mining. Uh, we have things like machine learning. Uh, we have things like network analysis, which are really interesting as well in terms of lots of people interacting with each other, especially when we talk about big learning, just like in big data, we have possibly something like big learning, right, uh, with lots of uh, stakeholders interacting. 
and, and then we have also visualization, which is part of, uh, of the sense making from the human side and, and usually what learning analytics has been traditionally used for. So to give some examples from uh, my own research on, on uh, visualization, here are some slides from a paper that uh, we published a long time ago now, 2016. Uh, from a system called Topolor, it was an e-learning system, and what what I would point out here is that it also shows you uh, the fact that uh, I mean the learning activities and the uh, fact that you have uh, uh, gone through some of the uh, pages that you are supposed to read, etc. But also shows you interactions or social interaction uh, with others, and it has various ways of comparing yourself with previous uh, work in different weeks, and, and at the same time with the average in the course and with the top 20, etc. Um, another uh, way of looking at things is to look at frequency. So, for instance, once you are able to, t uh, to take all those traces that I was talking about from the definition of Eric Duval of learning analytics uh, and group them uh, into some semantically meaningful way, in this case we uh, opted towards social navigation assessment, reading, and auxiliary. You can start looking at how different students, for instance, at individual level perform. So, for instance, the third student in a row has a big chunk of red. That means he's doing a lot of reading, whereas the first student uh, has, is doing a lot of social interaction and so on. Uh, and, and you can also look at these uh, activities in a temporal way. So, you can see that uh, the top student, the one with the blue, uh, has a lot of social interaction, so a lot of uh, uh, bot uh, the bottom level is a social interaction in this graph, um, but for instance, not so much reading, which would be uh, the third one from top to bottom. Uh, or uh, the red student has a lot of reading, um, but uh, and has also social interaction, so has a bit of uh, both. So you, you can start looking at this. So this would be very fine grain analysis at the level of of a student, or you can do it at a um, uh, various types of patterns kind of uh, matching where in this case we were looking at probabilities of transition between states so where the students all start and what would be the probability for them to transition to a different state so from social interaction in this case they all started in this particular system with social interaction and then they go to navigation or to auxiliary actions and then for instance from navigation they go to reading etc and we could look at patterns like that um, and then um, from a different paper and completely uh, more recent stuff, we, we did actually work on MOOCs as well. This was a little bit of a crazy idea of, of mine. Uh, we were, MOOCs usually, so traditionally the problem with MOOCs is that uh, they have very low level of completion. And there's lots of reasons why that is, and there's lots of papers about the reasons. Uh, some of them potentially not to do at all with the system themselves, but simply the people are looking for specific things, and once, once they have re uh, learned about them, they move on. That's fine. Um, but still, uh, we're looking at various predictors or potential predictors. In this case, we were playing with the registration data as a potential predictor to see if that may, act, may actually generate some kind of information about uh, when, uh, if a student is completing or not. And we found some statistically significant uh, correlations there. Uh, and, and eventually, because of that, we thought to get all the way to the prescriptive analytics part, we, we were proposing some rules in pseudocode in terms of what to do next for a student. Uh, so, for instance, well, the simple part would be uh, the top one that if they have registered a long time ago, we just tell them, you know, what? why don't you register a bit later, because you might actually uh, not, not do this course if, if, if you register so much in advance, uh, but slightly more personalized, because uh, this is my background is also in personalized learning, so the um, uh, the third one, I believe, uh, from from the top, uh, basically uh, uh, it, it says also, um, the last sentence there says also, please consider visiting these links for additional support. So that's where you uh, you would give them some recommendation of enrolling or de-enrolling or putting something in the uh, in their schedule, but also providing them with additional material which would help them in this case to catch up because they have those ones are people that have re uh, registered just a little bit after the course has started. So perhaps some kind of summary of what has happened so that they can catch up quickly. Um, so, so there's various interventions you can have and actually there's a lot of uh, literature on personalization. And for me, this is a very interesting time in terms of this big learning because basically 
uh, we all of a sudden, all these experiments we were doing at very small scale in personalized learning, intelligent tutoring systems, adaptive educational hypermedia, and all these areas, all of a sudden we can do them on big scale, and, and that's, that's very interesting. Uh, and, and start having, going beyond statistical significance, basically, where the big data lies. Um, other things in visualization, so we were playing around with 3D visualization, so we're looking at if the behavior in the first week and the last week are somehow correlated uh, in terms of, uh, so this is actually three-dimensional, but in four dimension, the fourth dimension being the, the color, and the color red means that they're uh, non-completers, and blue means that they're completers, and we're trying to see if students, uh, in this case, answered questions correctly, we were looking at incorrect answers and so forth, so more, the more traditional parameters. Uh, to, to predict uh, student behavior. Um, but generally speaking, you, you build uh, prediction models, uh, something like that, you with cleaning, feature engineering, using various algorithms and then reporting them. Uh, and uh, yes, this is one of uh, my favorite little uh, slides on uh, machine learning. Um, and then you do, can do some feature selection. This, uh, this is uh, another work of ours where we're looking at uh, features that are good predictors from the different weeks. Um, here we were, we were looking, for instance, at number of accesses and time spent per axis. Uh, in other places, so we look at gamification and so forth. This is not a MOOC study, it's a different study on gamification, but also a big data study. Uh, and we were looking at gender analysis. We, I do a lot of gender analysis as well in, in, for various reasons. Uh, and we were looking if uh, females and males uh, have, in this case, different preferences for, for the type of um, uh, gamification elements that, that they would use. Um, in general, uh, my, my, my great belief is that what, what we have done in the past is very much what I would call top-down kind of analysis. So we start from educators, psychologists, and teachers, and they uh, create some kind of models, and then we uh, try to implement these models and test them, and very often small scale, and this is what we've done in the past. Nowadays, we're, we're at a bottom-up kind of approach. We have all the student usage data and traces of the students, like I said, and from there we can build the systems uh, the other way around. My actual belief is that the, the, the truth is somewhere <laughs> in between and, and needs to combine these things. But we're not there yet. This is the direction I think we're moving towards. And speaking of gender, I wanted to mention very quickly uh, that we're also analyzing other things that we're doing. So TechUp is a retraining in IT uh, for women program that we've been uh, that we've been working at. We're training 100 women in IT from different backgrounds, especially underprivileged. And we have actually uh, a great uh, percentage of BAME, over 50%, uh, and quite a lot of social media presence. And uh, so some of the things we do, word cloud, but we do other kind of analytics. This is just because to show that they were very happy with us. Um, so in conclusion, I think uh, learning analytics is a very uh, interesting area at the moment. Uh, this data analytics and data mining field in general, they're both evolving really fast. The new methods are creating all the time and gives us great opportunities for higher education uh, for all parts in the process and for all the uh, stakeholders. So thank you very much. I'll end here for now. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes, I can. <laughs> So uh, if you can hear me, that's really amazing. Thank you so much, Alexandra. It's really lovely. And uh, I'd love to introduce now Olaf Zavaki Richter, who is our next. Uh, Olaf Zavaki Richter is a professor of educational technology at the University of Oldenburg in Germany. And his major work uh, recently was uh, by reviewing uh, research on artificial intelligence in higher education, and this is going to be published by the International Journal of Education, Technology, and Higher Education. Olaf, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me now. Uh, sometimes we are struggling with technology. And uh, yeah, I had big problems setting up my computer and the speakers and the microphone and had to get another computer, but now it works. So now I can talk about artificial intelligence in education. OK. Um, the theoretical and mathematical foundations of artificial intelligence has been developed 
decades ago. It was uh, John McCarthy who organized the first work workshop in the USA, and they made the conjecture that every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can, in principle, be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. And this is what he termed artificial intelligence. And the algorithms for, for AI applications are extremely data hungry and need a lot of computing power. And that's why we are seeing this, this huge wave of interest now because of the exponential growth of computing power and the abundance of digital big data that is now available via the internet in social networks or sensors that produce massive amounts of visual data never seen before. Um, at this, and this development will have or already has an impact of our field of education and higher education in particular according to various reports that predict massive growth rates uh, of AI in education like the Horizon Report or Contact North uh, who conclude that there is little doubt that the technology is inexorably linked to the future of higher education. And universities are making heavy investments like the Technical University in Eindhoven. They uh, announced that they will launch a new AI research institute with 50 new professorships. Um, given the interdisciplinarity of, of the field, I think it's necessary to clarify uh, terminology first. Um, artificial intelligence does not describe a single technology. It is an umbrella term to describe a range of technologies and methods, such as machine learning, natural language processing, data mining, or a single algorithm. And machine learning and AI are often mentioned in the same breath. Machine learning is a method of AI for supervised and unsupervised classification and profiling, like we have just seen. And deep learning, in turn, is a method of machine learning based on artificial uh, neural networks. And this method was used by AlphaGo to defeat the best human Go player on Earth. Um, it remains a philosophical question whether machines will be able to think. And this would be called strong AI, and it's still science fiction. All AI and machine learning applications today are based on weak AI or good old-fashioned AI. Machines are just simulating thinking and show hopefully rational behavior. So computers act as if they were intelligent. They are a one-trick horse. They can perform clearly defined tasks much better and more efficient than a human could do. So AlphaGo defeated the best human Go player on Earth, but the machine does not know how to play tic-tac-toe. Um, oops. So what is artificial intelligence in, in education? Some Spanish colleagues wrote, this technology is already being introduced in the field of higher education, although many teachers are unaware of its scope and, above all, of what it consists of. There is a recent report on AI ed uh, by Baker and Smith, and they use the definition that I find very helpful. Um, they, they distinguish three uh, different perspectives to categorize AI applications in, in education. Uh, there are learner-facing applications like an adaptive LMS or an intelligent tutoring system. Teacher-facing applications like assessment tools or plagiarism detection tools. And system-facing IAE tools like monitoring tools on an institutional level. Uh, we use this framework as well in our systematic review on AI in, ed in higher education that we wrote for this special issue in the International Journal of Educational Technology in Higher Education. Um, this paper is available now since the end of October, and I'm glad to see that it has already been downloaded over 1,700 times. So I think this also shows the great interest in that topic. Um, we do not have time to talk 
a lot about this systematic review method, which comes from medicine and the health sciences. Um, the application in educational research or social science is a bit different. So those who would like to learn more about it, I refer to our new book that will be published in an open access format, hopefully in December, about the systematic review methodology. So in our article, we addressed uh, review questions in, in three areas. The first one was about mapping the research uh, publications. Where are they published? Uh, where are the authors coming from, from and so on? Then we looked at the concepts and ethics. How is AI in education conceptualized? And, and what kind of ethical implications and challenges and risks are considered in the publications? And uh, finally, what, what is the nature and scope of, of, of the AI applications in the context of, of higher education? It is quite interesting to note that the vast majority of AED research is done in the context of higher education institutions. We found only very few studies about AI in schools, in continuing education, corporate training, or vocational, vocational training. The field is clearly dominated by colleagues coming from computer science and STEM departments. Over 60% were written by computer scientists, engineers, and mathematicians. Only 13 papers, less than 10%, were authored by scholars from, from education departments. Um, uh, we used the concept of the student life cycle as a framework to describe the various AI-based services at the, stu at the institutional and, and administrative level, as well as at the academic support level for teaching and learning. Um, and then we described uh, four broad areas of AI applications in, uh, in our synthesis, profiling and prediction, adaptive systems and personalization, intelligent tutoring systems, and assessment and evaluation. And they contain 18 sub-areas. And we, we cannot go into much detail here. You can read this in our, our article. I just would like to highlight a few things in the next slides. Uh, Chen and Do write that the accurate prediction of students' academic performance is of importance for making admission decisions, as well as providing better educational services. And some colleagues from, from Turkey published a study in which they predicted admission decisions at the College of Physical Education and Sports with an accuracy of about 97% using different uh, machine learning algorithms. Oops. Um, intelligent tutoring systems. Uh, they can be used to simulate one-to-one -one personal tutoring. And based on learner models, algorithms, they can make decisions about the learning path of an individual student and the content to select and provide cognitive scaffolding and help and to encourage students in, in dialogue. This example is uh, uh, Duolingo. They use uh, chatbots for language learning, for example. Automated essay scoring. Um, articles that utilized uh, automatic grading, they came from a range of disciplines. And by, they are used in biology, medicine, business studies, Engri uh, English as second language. But they were mostly focused on its use in undergraduate courses. Uh, and that's because. These systems are practical for large courses due to the need to, to sort of calibrate or train the systems with pre-scored assignments. That's uh, supervised machine learning. And uh, I found one very interesting example. Giel and colleagues um, uh, used AES systems for large-scale assessment. Uh, in Canada, uh, there's a, 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 um, a Medical Council of Canada qualifying uh, examination. Canadian students have to take this test uh, in, in, in 2013. Over 5,000 uh, students took this test. 
and 100 raters needed four days or up to 3,200 hours to score the items of this test. And Gil and colleagues, they used a machine learning classification system um, and with this approach they required, the system required over about three hours of one rater uh, to calibrate the system and then the system needed 10 seconds to score the 2013 examination. I think this is quite uh, interesting. Uh, with an agreement of uh, 97 or to 98 um, percent. Okay, and then there are of course also adaptive systems. We heard about that. Um, Century is um, a company that claims to be the first offering an AI-based learning management system. The system is but in intended for schools, uh, not so much for higher education. And the learning path is based on, on small nuggets of knowledge. And well, I, I think this is not what we understand by complex competence development at universities. OK, another question of our systematic review was, how authors consider ethical implications, challenges and risks implementing AI in education. And as I already said, AI applications are very data hungry and require a lot of confidential data from students and faculty. So this is where issues of privacy and data protection come in. Or faculty members and tutors might fear that and an intelligent agent or an automated essay scoring system might take their jobs. So I think generally we, we should not strive what is always strive for, for what is technically possible, but always ask ourselves what makes pedagogical sense. In China, systems are already being introduced to monitor student participation and expressions via face recognition in classrooms and display them to the teacher and, and to the parents on a dashboard, so-called intelligent classroom behavior management systems. You, you can buy that in China. But what does this do to children who believe that the teacher can now read their thoughts? I would like to finish with a quote from uh, Russell and Norvik who remind us in their leading textbook on artificial intelligence, all AI researchers should be concerned with the ethical implications of their work. And a stunning result of our systematic review is that only two papers out of the 146 studies included um, um, of ours is uh, reflected on, 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 on those ethical uh, implications. And I think this is something we must chew on, on this fact in our discussion. That's why we are asking, where are the educators? So here we are. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Olaf. Thank you very much for this presentation. <coughs> I, now it's time for the last presentation of this webinar. Um, it's a pleasure to me to introduce Cristobal Cobo. Cristobal Cobo is now a senior uh, education specialist at the World Bank. Uh, he, used, he used to work uh, or stay before on the Thebal Foundation in Uruguay and, and also doing research and before that or during that also in the, at the Institute, at, at the Oxford Internet Institute at, at the University of, of Oxford. Uh, please, Cristobal, go ahead. The floor is yours. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Well, Joseph, thank you very much for the invitation, for the introduction. Thank you to Eden for uh, organizing this activity and to my fellow panelists for extremely insightful comments. Um, so I'll try to talk briefly, um, connecting some of the, the ideas mentioned by my colleagues. Um, as Tony said, my expertise is not on, on AI. I've been working for 10 years or so in human-computer interaction, and I'm especially interested in tackling some of the social implications of technology. 
So uh, the presentation of Olaf, particularly the last part, I think connect very smoothly with the ideas that I would like to offer to you. Um, and I guess the title in a way suggests in which direction I would like to go. If you have a look at this uh, Google trend, which is an aggregated way of um, uh, monitoring the searches of people, you will see that between 2013 and 2019, the searchers, the search queries on artificial intelligence have, have almost doubled, which is a not scientific, but very rough and illustrative um, vision of the growing interest in this field. Has been, has, has it been presented now, I'm not going to go on details, um, AI in education has some um, pockets of uh, expertise in approaches like automated early grading, providing tools for automatic feedback, um, customizes some of the contents that can be helpful for the learner, um, plagiarism also is another uh, strong player, as well as spiritual teaching assistance. Now, um, I think we are today in a good moment for exploring how to bring in this conversation the potentials of AI in education, as well as the harms. And, and I, I try to stay away from the extremisms, um, either utopia or dystopian. I think we have to navigate in between. Um, but I will try to emphasize on some of the tensions that I, I see in this field today. So, um, my impression so far is we have an important and growing gap between the expectations, the expectatives, what, what is being discussed today, um, and the reality. And, I, and, and, and that gap, I think, in, a, in part is because we tend to uh, search for quick solutions to complex problems. Um, digital technologies uh, are extremely helpful to deliver contents. But the, the learning experience is, is, is a complex challenge. And, and the social experience tend to be highly embedded into, into the learning. And probably the massive dropout that was mentioned by Alexandra can be connected with that. So, um, and, and I think there is a lack of um, critical analysis on that. That's why I really value the, the ending of Olaf's presentation, but as well as his, as his paper, where he highlighted that over 2,600 papers, the lack of critical analysis of, of some of the unintended consequences or the negative effects of digital technology is, is a matter of concern. My take is today is the end of the digital honeymoon, uh, and it's important also to address the other, the other side of the coin. Um, in digital education, we know very well, all of us who have been working in this field for years, know that tend to be driven by solutionism using models of concept, which is every social or educational problem has a quick fix through technology. And, and when we have seen the adoption of technology into the learning experience, we have to understand that the process uh, does, is not growing exponentially as a law, as, as the Moore's law. Uh, it requires to address um, the system of change, change of behavior, and overall adapting the culture of our organizations. And you know better than me that higher ed tends to be an organization that takes a lot of time to change its practices. Now, um, I'm not going to deny some of the incredible things that we see today in the world of AI. I mean, the capacity of predict, to adapt, to self-learn, to identify patterns, to uh, reason in some ways, to solve some problems, even to recognize voices, images, and languages is certainly incredible. But the truth is, when we think in seriously in the concept of artificial intelligence, there's a very, very great oxymoron between them. Because intelli intelligence is much more than the um, effective use of information. Um, we, as humans, when we learn, when we build a networks, when we recognize mistakes, when we adapt to uncertain environments, we need to apply all these other capacities and intelligence which are critical. Social intelligence, emotional intelligence, self-efficacy, adaptability. Um, and I think artificial intelligence, as has been described, is really far from that. So I don't think it's a concept that is particularly helpful. That's why I appreciate it as being a scaffolding you know, or the much more specific 
concepts. And the other element that tend to be ignored in, in many of the approaches with uh, technology in general is there's a massive difference between knowing and understanding. Um, and many of these technologies are very effective for accumulating knowledge. But understanding means a much more complex way of um, dealing with information because you have to understand in which context is developed, what implications it may have, how it evolved, how it's influenced. And this is because um, it's critical to understand the knowledge in the context. It's not that easy to export from one context into another. The third idea, I think, has to do with um, what I would call an asymmetry of information or a sort of data feudalism. Apologize for the metaphor, but I think today uh, higher education institutions are in a kind of um, very um, vulnerable position waiting for these adoptions, uh, technology developments to be deployed and implemented. So overall, beyond AI, uh, the way that technology is being deployed and implemented in today's world is generated by a small number of developers, geeks, coders, whatever you want to call them. The interfaces are imp implemented and, and, and designed and adapted by a small group of people and regulations are done by a small group of people which using the digital feudalism metaphor we could say are the, the, the scribes and we have a large large sector of the of the society which are passive use of technology developed by somebody else and this um, we generate not only asymmetries but also generate a number of tensions that i think is fair to address them in today's world in which we have seen that many of the technological deployments have generated unintended consequences through this so-called extractive economy, in which organizations say that they will take very seriously the information of the user, but they end up being in a third party hands without any clear any clear notification or without all with all the notifications, but in a complex way that human beings don't understand. So this data surplus that can generate uh, improvements in learnings or uh, much more uh, scalable technical solutions, I think we need to address a way of having the users in the conversation and not um, just as a passive ones. Now, my, my fourth element has to do with, um, with the idea of the bias. If you have a look at this uh, search query that I did for CEO, you would see that most of the ones who show up in the, in the first result are male, uh, Western, many of them, middle-aged and white. And, and you may wonder why there's no women, why there's no young people, why, why don't we have people from different uh, um, backgrounds. And I think that in a way is illustrative that the algorithm, algorithms are not uh, biased by itself, but the way that they're fed with information um, make that there's a very clear imbalance. And one of the concerns I have is there's a large number of the society that think that algorithms are neutral. So there's an important challenge here to address how to develop higher levels of awareness that are not going to be solved only publishing AI ethic guidelines, which is super trendy today, as you may say, as you may see, um, a large number of companies which uh, shout very loudly that they are committed with transparency and citizens. But we have heard this story before. Uh, Google in 1998 published this Don't Be Evil. And today we see that many of this data has been used in many ways that were not clear for us. And the context bias means that we don't see things as we are. We see things as we are. And that tends to affect the way that we interact with technology. Uh, because that is replicated in the technology. So we have a lot of work to do not only to improve the algorithms, but also a lot of work to do in incre increase the level of fairness, accountability, transparency, and explainability. And as I said, it's not enough to publish them in, in guidelines on ethical principles, because this is directly connected with dealing with ambiguities, contradictions, and complex environments when a larger sector of the society is adopting this technology. And my, my last slide, has to do with um, what I would call choosing not to choose. So many of us use a large number of AI systems today, not in the future, with a number of apps and social networks that help us to think on our behalf. So part of our cognitive uh, uh, capacity, we download this capacity in the systems that help us to think on our behalf. But there are some challenges behind that because we don't 
always understand how the systems work. The black box are evident. Um, and and the this, this citizen, as I said, in this kind of uh, basal position or passive position, they don't understand what what actions they need to take, how to clarify that. Um, um, very, very easily, when we design the system, I think it's, it's fair enough to question um, what could be some of, some of the ethical implications of that. Uh, how the, the algorithm was built, how representative is the data from, from minorities or communities that might not be necessarily represented, as I show you in the CEO search. And, and this idea of the ethics by design cannot be a feature at the end of the academic papers. If you search on AI uh, academic publications, you will find that AI and ethics is always in the last last paragraph. So I think we have to have an important task here in order to ensure mechanis mechanisms to open the black box, to diver diver diversify the data that we use to train the algorithms, to understand that this are leading us to new problems and complex problems will require complex solutions. Uh, we don't solve these problems only showing a big banner with a uh, announcement that your data is being tracked. Um, and I would say there are a few recommendations that I would like to conclude with. The first one is we in, in the higher education, but in education in general and probably in a larger sector as well, we will have to update the society with, with, with this idea of AI literacy. People need to understand at least the basics and need to understand how to react when they receive an orientation just given by an automated decision. The second one has to do with we have a lot of work to do in terms of improving the quality of the data infrastructure we have today. Otherwise, we will tend to replicate the problems of the past in the future decisions. And that will be connected certainly with my third recommendation, which is to develop AI for education systems, which are representative of, that, of a multidisciplinary perspective with different visions with people from computer science, certainly, but from psychology, from the legal background, from sociology and other disciplines, because we need to bring all these voices into this technology that is very powerful. And finally, I think it's fair enough to go on this idea of certifying responsible uses of AI to ensure that we will reduce as much as possible the consequences. And I want to finish with this quote from Kai Fu Li, who wrote this highly recommendable book, AI Superpower. He said that AI is the new electricity and big data is the oil that powered the generators. And this is very nice, but if we use the same analogy to sing in the global warming, these fossil, fuel, uh, fossil fuels that we are uh, wasting today in a responsible way, um, I think are related with the poor use of data. So perhaps we one day can change the paradigm, moving from large volumes of data, um, or algorithms are extremely data hungry, as Olaf said, into probably a smarter use of this data in a more efficient way, ensuring that won't affect anyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Olaf. Can you all hear me now? Excellent point, uh, Olaf. So uh, let's start now with uh, with some discussions, and I will go back to our speakers, and probably I will invite first uh, Tony Bates, which uh, mentioned during his presentation that most worry thing for me, this is Tony Bates, is the application of AI and the ethics, and what is AI doing in education. In this case, is it not AI more to make the life easier for administrator, but not taking so much into context or into vision, yes, the student? Tani, if you want to say something more about this. Do you want to say something? Okay. Honey? Okay, if any other uh, of the presenters want to say something about this uh, Diana question. 
If not, there is uh, other questions on the chat. Okay, Tony is typing where? Tony is typing. I am. Uh, I can't unmute my mic. I know my. I, I had the same problem. Don't worry, no. Tony. Okay. So I nice. came up. Sorry. Okay. Um, thank you for un unmuting the mic. Um, I, I think that at the moment the emphasis has been a little bit more in actual applications on. Uh, providing information that's useful for administrators, particularly in terms of admissions and marketing. Um, it doesn't have to be that way. I, I think one of the issues is um, who's defining the applications at the moment. Um, uh, I, I think it's a very good question to ask who, who is the agent, who is the client for this uh, kind of application and who, who, who's pushing it, if you like. Um, so I think there are some issues around that. It seems to me that a lot of the applications are being driven by computer scientists doing research on the topic rather than actually um, an institution making a deliberate decision to use artificial intelligence. The, the, the only example I can think of here in Canada is Athabasca University, who is seriously working with IBM, I believe it is. Uh, to develop an automated tutoring system for assistance education programs. Um, so uh, everything's piecemeal at the moment. It, it doesn't seem to be developed system-wide, which may be good in the sense that we get some idea of what's happening. Once it gets applied at the system-wide level, I think it becomes much more difficult to, to stop it if it's, if it's not going in the right direction. Those are my comments. Thank you very much uh, for this, Tony. That's uh, really a good input. I have Olaf, which is uh, want to comment further. Olaf? Yes, yes. I, I would like to agree with uh, Tony. I, I can't, uh, speaking for Germany, for German higher education institutions, I also can't really see a, a wide application of, of, of these tools uh, in, in, the, in the institutional practice. Uh, like in Canada with Athabasca University, it's also here in Germany, the Fern University in Hagen. They have a cooperation with the German Institute for Artificial Intelligence Research in Berlin. And uh, they are de developing together tools for, um, they are developing chatbots and, and, and also doing some research on, on um, automated essay scoring. But it is still all in a, prototype, project-based status, and there is no institution-wide applications of, of, of these systems. Thank you. Alexandra, as you are one of the computer scientists here, so do you have a point as a computer scientist? Yes, yes, we're, I'm one of the uh, unwanted computer scientists. Um, I mean, okay, so part of, uh, I'm also an educator, I'm also been in education system forever and I've also been doing a lot of research, so I, these questions are in a way not new. Every time there's a new technology, there's also a great fear. I was also following the, the chat, so, uh, and, and there was discussion about, you know, will, will um, you know, bringing in AI uh, replace people, replace jobs, etc. I mean, this, these questions, if you look at, you know, the, uh, technological, the uh, uh, technological revolution. Every time we have a new technology, uh, there's a great fear, uh, and uh, sometimes it is uh, it is disruptive. But often, more often than not, uh, it's disruptive for a while, and um, and after a while, basically, uh, we find that our lives improve and we use these technologies, and then uh, we find other better ways of uh, employing our minds. I mean, we don't all plow. Uh, the field these days, right? And uh, we could have done this in the past, but now we have technology doing that for us. So instead, we're having these lovely discussions. I mean, this whole discussion we're doing online over the internet, and it's, it's facilitated by technology. And we couldn't do it over such great distances uh, if we wouldn't have that, um, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we had the example of Duolingo before. I believe Olaf put the slide up. 
and I had uh, been at the uh, talk of uh, the owner of Duolingo in AID conference, and one of the things that really, to some extent, sh shocked me um, uh, was something he said about uh, online tutors and, and human tutors, because we always had this discussion in the past. Every time we talked about personalization and education, we had the discussion, well, what about the teacher, and will we be replacing the teacher? And the usual standard reply to this was, well, no, it's just enhancing the teacher. The teacher can still be there, and 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 we're we're just uh, giving the teacher and the student more capabilities. But what really shocked me was <laughs> that uh, you know the Duolingo owner he just said, we want to replace the teacher. We don't want any teachers anymore because teachers are basically expensive. Teachers are also not scalable. They have millions and millions of users. They want to do everything automatic. <laughs> and I was a little bit sad. I mean, had stood back up when, when, about this very upfront reaction. I'm not sure it's the best way forward, but it's a tiny application, and, and it seems that it works for them. Um, so, and we have a lot of online learning. We have uh, um, universities that work online. Um, we have uh, we also talked about bypassing learning, uh, bypassing traditional ways of learning like higher education, and to, to some extent that is a potential. Uh, there's lots of companies, I mean, the bigger companies that basically create their own um, training programs and sort of apprenticeship programs into, into, the jo into their jobs. Um, so, um, and these conversion courses, etc. Uh, so, I, I, I'm, I'm sure that uh, there might be some changes and maybe higher education will have, will have to change itself uh, uh, to, to follow these changes. But at the same time, I think there will be great opportunities. So uh, that's part of my answer. I could talk more about it. Very much, Alexandra. Yes, uh, I know. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Yes, this reminds me. So, for example, back in the 90s, when I uh, when I done my master in artificial intelligence, everybody was afraid of artificial intelligence because we were doing it for robots, and then the robots will become much more cleverer than human beings and so on. And it still hasn't happened, and it's more than 20 years since then. So uh, I just want to remind you uh, a study done, for example, at the Georgia Tech University, where they used a lot of chatbots and so on in Coursera. A lot of the answers on in the online uh, platform of, for MOOCs Coursera are done and answered by chatbots. And at the end, they done a survey to see if uh, the learners have realized if there are chatbots or not, if there are robots, and in fact, artificial intelligence answering to their questions or, and not human beings. And more than 65% of the learners didn't uh, realize that that's uh, a machine answering to their questions. And they prefer mostly the questions, and sorry, the answers, which were provided by, to the questions by the artificial intelligence, by the machines, than those by the educator. So this is really worrying for me. I will never forget when I read, read that paper and uh, when I also listened that the ICAL to that presentation because that's really worrying. But I would like to move now further down to uh, something more, which is also worrying me somehow. Can you really monitor learning? Can learning happen only online and you can monitor only with technology or is more an individual thing? And is it really possible to see that if you learn something, is more effective or not effective? Alexandra spoke about behavior part patterns that also lead somehow to that area. But uh, maybe, Alexandra, Olaf, uh, you want to comment if you really think that you can monitor learning, as learning is more an intrinsic uh, effect. So, well, is there Andra? one of the presenters or to Olaf? say something about this question from Diana? Can you also answer, okay. please? Thank you, Christova. I think Olaf is right. Olaf, you have to put your mic on. <laughs> my, my, my comment on that question um, is yes, Tony please. here. Yes, Tony. 
I, I am concerned about the assumption of what learning is in many artificial intelligence and learning analytics applications. Um, uh, it, it's particularly on the testing side, what, what is being tested, um, it, 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 it reflects a, a kind of view of learning that I don't have at all. I, I see learning as developmental. In a, in a sense, if you take a concept like heat, uh, how hot something is, um, you know, there are various levels of learning there. You can feel heat from touching it. Uh, you can uh, learn that you can measure heat in terms of temperature. You, you can uh, look at the chemical uh, processes that are happening when things get hot and so on. So, so the concept of heat isn't static at all. It's, uh, for, for an individual, it's very de developmental. And a lot of the learning analytics, and uh, particularly, are kind of trying to capture something at one specific point in time, and then drawing a pattern from that. Um, when in fact, uh, and I see this particularly in the predict in the predictive studies, where they're trying to uh, test somebody on where they are in the first week of the course, and can they tell where they're going to be at the end of the course. Um, and it's not my view of how learning takes place. It's an iterative process. It's a reflective process. And none of that is captured in the data. Now, you could argue that's true in face-to-face -face teaching as well. We don't know what the students are doing. you know. And in some ways, we know more in an online environment about what they're doing than we do in a face-to-face -face environment. Um, but the danger is that you measure the things that you can count, and you don't measure the things that are hard to count or, 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 or are, are less observable. And, and I think that's a real problem, not just for artificial intelligence, for teaching in general. But when artificial intelligence focuses almost entirely on the observable, immediate state of learning in an individual, then I think you've got problems. Thank you very much, uh, Tony. Really a good insight. I think, yes, uh, we shall think about when we start having problems. Is Cristobal, do you want to comment on that? Uh, yes, unfortunately, I'm always, uh, I, I tend to agree with Tony in a regular way, so this is not going to be the exception. I, I, one of the concerns I have is we tend to overrate what we can measure. And I think the saying, don't value what you measure, measure what you value, is really applicable here. Because uh, you can measure clicks, but there are few things that you cannot measure. Would you say, for instance, that education, learn, the learning experience is completely disassociated uh, of trust or frustration? I would say there's no learning without trust, and there's no learning without some level of frustration. How do you measure trust? How do you measure frustration? These are concepts that are completely difficult. We can build some index, we can build some proxies, but it will be difficult to measure. So I'm all about supporting uh, learning analytics, but we need to understand the massive uh, limitations that these kind of approaches have. Thank you. Anna Cristina is writing something interesting. Yes, Alexandra, yes, you can. You can pop in. Um, so uh, I mean, I think uh, all points raised are, are valid. Uh, I'm not saying AI is a ma magic bullet, but I'm just saying it's a great opportunity, and, and uh, you know we, we shouldn't miss it uh, by saying oh it's not going to answer all the questions. Because to be uh, fair, even human tutors can get things wrong and and don't necessarily answer all the questions. Um, at the same time, I'm a great believer that that we have to very carefully look at at these things. Uh, and, and I, one of my second slide was about us hiring people, and one of the areas we're hiring is bias in AI. And I actually wrote that application. And, and we're looking, we're very interested to get people that work on all aspects uh, of bias, starting with ethics uh, and the ethical concerns, all the way to algorithmics and algorithms producing the wrong results, like uh, the type that uh, Cristobal was, was showing us uh, where, uh, you know, an algorithm. So there are some classic examples if you take. A piece of text and translate it automatically with Google Translate. Like uh, uh, she is uh, uh, the CEO, he is the secretary. If you translate it back and forth uh, from a language, you're going to get he is the CEO, she is the secretary, right? So this kind of stereotypes. 
so these are uh, AI. Uh, so the AI has learned the wrong thing because of the many wrong examples that it has been uh, given and so forth. So this would be algorithmic kind of uh, issue. So so I, we're interested in the whole scale of that. I think it's a very serious and uh, interesting thing of, of, of these days. So at the same time, when we build this, this new systems, we, we need to take that into account. Absolutely. So I, I do agree with that. <laughs> Thank you, Alexandra. Yes, it's a big debate about the ethics of uh, artificial intelligence. And I quite like Anna Christina's comment about social development and learning. I don't know if what she meant exactly about social development, but uh, the thing which, for example, crosses into my mind is that if our students know that uh, they are monitored and their behavior is going to be improved, for example, we tested and we evaluated this with our students in my university, in Timisoara, and when they know that we watch them, <laughs> let's make it like that, then uh, they behave differently. So is it not changing the behaviors of our students? Uh, with uh, the impact, one of the impacts of artificial intelligence. So, if uh, Olaf wants to comment on this, or, or Cristobal, or Tony, any of you is free, just pop in. So, basically, my question is, is the behavior of our students changing so much? when they know that they are monitored and their analytics are considered towards either better results or uh, to put them somewhere in uh, separate groups or something like that. Anybody wants to comment on this? Tani? Uh, yes, I... I agree that the ethics issues is important, but one issue that hasn't been talked about as much is the value issues and what people value. Why we have educate, public education, for instance. Um, I mean, my view of teaching and learning is that you, you, you need to help every student if possible. And so when you get uses of artificial intelligence for screening students out, then I have a real problem with that. It's not an ethical issue. I mean, from an institution's point of view, they want the students who are most likely to succeed. But uh, from, a, from a societal point of view, we really want all students to succeed. So what do we do about the students who are screened out? Um, uh, so it's not so much the actual use of artificial intelligence. It's, it, it's, it's um, understand the values that drive education, and could we use artificial intelligence in a way that actually reflects those values rather than just runs right over it? It's a rhetorical question, Tony, or one to which totally we expect an answer. Uh, just a comment. Not, I think it's also very important to see all of these things from the learner's perspective, because usually we are talking here about uh, from the institution also, we, are, we were talking about predictions, et cetera, and all that. It's possible uh, control from the learning perspective uh, all of this data that some other people are collecting and are predicting and are analyzing from, from us, not uh, as, as a learners in that case. No? Uh, can I can I please uh, say something, uh, Diana? Because uh, I notice a lot of discussion about uh, personalization here and learners being different and stuff like that. Um, and I think especially now uh, in uh, so for instance, if you go on uh, MOOCs, right, uh, and and you participate, you will notice that uh, there's discussions and so forth. And you have for each of those items in the discussion. Uh, for each of the elements of the course, for instance, in Future Learn, you can get for each little video or piece of text, you can get hundreds, if not thousands, of comments of users. And it's really hard to tell which are relevant to you in any possible way. There's no personalization at the moment, right? So um, trying to filter that based on your, your interests, your um, needs, etc., 
it, it could be very, very helpful and, and you know, uh, guiding you through all that material. And this is the kind of thing that uh, adaptive personalized uh, learning can do for you. So it can actually cater for individuality even uh, on a large scale, whereas that's completely not scalable for, for one teacher. So, so they do have human teachers and they do try to make some sort of summary at the end uh, about what, what has been discussed there, etc. But they, they barely scratch the surface because they, they just can't reply to each and every every student. One of my PhD students is actually specifically looking at where instruction intervention is needed on these massive online learning systems because it's a vital thing to know to whom to answer to try to pick up those that in, in this case might might actually uh, be dropping out. But but there's all sorts of other levels that that you know we could automatically look at, which are just not feasible for one yeah. person basically as a teacher. Cristobal, if you want to comment on this, please. Sure, thank you. Um, Cristobal? Yes, can you hear me? So, my take is, um, it's, it's, it's difficult to navigate in the, in the tensions because they're not black or white. It's not with or without teachers. It's teachers with AI replacing some activities. Now in the US, there's a large, a growing interest in automating all the uh, assignment scores. And this is, this is gaining momentum. And, and today we know that these systems have bias. Uh, but let's be honest. I mean, teachers um, revising assignments uh, assessment will also have some level of bias. And, and, and because of the speed and the scale, it's very unlikely that this will, be, uh, this will disappear. So um, I think we have to address that there's a new kid on the block. And we need to find systems to educate people, not to be against technology, but develop some level of algorithmic thinking, understand how the systems work, the level of bias they may have, the, the, the strengths and the weakness, develop some level of skeptical, uh, smart skepticism, which is understand that may fail, uh, and, uh, incorporate this kind of ethical fluency, which is understand who might be affected, and when possible, some level of self-regulation. And with these elements, we will have the people better prepared, not to be against technology, but to use technology in a wise way. Thank you for this, uh, Cristobal and everyone. At the end, because we are almost closing, I would like each of you to choose one single word to describe the future of AI in education. So you only are only allowed one single word, and because uh, we are and, and uh, we are presenters, not presenters, but we are moderators. And to give you one minute of thought, my word will be inclusive. I think AI will make education more inclusive. So that's my pick. So please, everyone, uh, who wants to start first? Take the women first, sure, so Alexandra. Sure. Um, actually, potential, if I, um, I'm only allowed one word, <laughs> potential. Cristobal? Hesitation. Olaf? Scalability. Tony? Yes. Tony? Yes. Okay, maybe Tony. Sorry? No, no, no. Tony? I... Joseph? What's your word then? Dangerous. Dangerous. Ooh. No, no, I don't have a word. Tony, dangerous? <laughs> Joseph, <laughs> for you? Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Joseph? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, we have to finish, uh, Diana, because it's 29. Okay. Uh, uh, can you put my last slide, please, Dora? Yes. Or maybe I can do it, I don't know. Oh, yes, I can do it. Okay, just a few words, to, just to thank you, everyone. Thank you to all of the presenters. Also, thank you to the people that, uh, the audience, because there is a, it was a very interesting debate on the chat. And just uh, one minute to remind our uh, next events. Of course, tomorrow we will have another one, another, another um, uh, webinar, uh, European Distance Learning Week. 
I just remember that the next events next year, the Eden Conference will be in Timisoara, where in, 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 Diana's, in Diana University in Romania. And also next year, it's time for our uh, research workshop. Uh, this research workshop will be in October in Lisbon, uh, hosted by the Universidad Aberta uh, of Portugal. And in, in, in these two uh, events, uh, as, as usual, uh, we are um, also um, preparing a PhD symposium for PhD students, PhD candidates, in Timisoara and also in Lisbon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, all of you. Diana, if, if you want to say something. Thank you very much. It was really very, very interesting. And I'm expecting that we can continue the discussion about how we use AI in education and how is the impact of AI in education in Timisoara. So I'm welcoming you soon in Timisoara. Thank you again to all of you. Thank you, everybody. And I need to thank especially to the comments and the questions which were raised. We really like them a lot. And it's food for thought, everything what happened here today. Thank you. Bye.